You're listening to Scaling Up Services, where we speak with entrepreneurs, authors, business experts, and thought leaders to give you the knowledge and insights you need to scale your service-based business faster and easier. And now, here is your host, business coach, Bruce Eckfeld. Are you a CEO looking to scale your company faster and easier? Check out Thrive Roundtable. Thrive combines a moderated peer group mastermind, expert one-on-one coaching, access to proven growth tools, and a 24-7 support community. Created by Inc. award-winning CEO and certified scaling-up business coach Bruce Eckfeldt, Thrive will help you grow your business more quickly and with less drama. For details on the program, visit Eckfeldt.com slash thrive. That's E-C-K. F-E-L-D-T dot com slash thrive. Welcome, everyone. This is Scaling Up Services. I'm Bruce Eckfeldt. I'm your host. And our guest today is Eric Tosig, and he is founder and CEO of Prialto. They are an executive assistant service. We're going to find out about how he's developed, grown that company across three different continents. We're going to talk to him about his entrepreneurial experience, his journey about scaling a service-based business. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the service itself and how leaders in service-based companies can leverage uh, these kind of services to best leverage their time, their capabilities, so they can focus on the growth and the strategy and uh, actually scaling the business. So with that, Eric, welcome to the program. Yeah. Hey, thanks. Great to be here. Yeah, I appreciate the time. So let's learn a little bit about you first, understand kind of your background. How did you get into being a founder? What was that like? And then we'll talk a little bit about the business and your experience scaling your business. Okay. So my background should have always been an entrepreneur, always have been on the inside, but kind of... um, was always thinking I had to build the resume first. So uh, professional services, banking in New York and Hong Kong before and after business school, came back to uh, the West Coast, San Francisco, where I grew up in 2004 and had the chance to get involved in a couple of technology companies and then the opportunity to start my own thing. Yeah. And um, had an idea. My wife, then fiance, said, "Do it now." Um, <laughs> Go for <laughs> it's it. It's not going to get any aid. Yeah, exactly. So, um, and actually, the idea for Prialto kind of came from some work she was doing, helping a uh, Nasdaq listed company manage their offshore team in the Philippines. And I kind of got to know her team and thought, "Hey, there's a lot of companies that don't know how to develop this." could utilize it. Yeah. And that would bring together a lot of my passions around um, yeah, the problems and opportunities of doing business cross-border, cross-culturally, connecting people, helping people, but a lot of my different interests together. And so that's yeah. Rialto. I'm curious what, um, you know, having been involved in, in various early stage companies directly and indirectly, and then starting your own, what was the difference when, when it was your own company? How did things change? What were you, any surprises, any observations about <laughs> actually be, being the founder versus is working for a founder or being involved in a company that was, you know, early stage? Yeah. I mean, you, you know, you're clearly, you're really putting yourself out there. You know, you can't kind of toe dip. You have to jump in with, with, with your full self and, and you need to recruit and, and develop a team that's going to do that with you. And so you're attached to the entity in a way you're just not if you're if you're kind of um, you know hired into a larger company. Yeah, yeah. And how did you go from kind of this initial idea so you you know had some insight around where the needs were, where the problems were for some of these companies that are that are working with these these types of teams? How did you go from kind of insight to actually, you know, I guess getting your company up and running? What was the first kind of stages like? What where did you find your initial clients? What came first, <laughs> the clients or the team? Uh, tell us about that process. Well, it was very iterative I, I did have a team first before clients and, and built a little bit of infrastructure and some connectivity that was a little bit harder to build back then. So this was just as smartphones were starting to get traction and um, not everybody had realized that communication costs were going to you know effectively zero, meaning you can connect two people to work together anywhere in the world for for really nothing. Yeah. But the hard part is building the context. So that I, I guess that was the insight is that I believed and continue to believe that, well, mechanically, it's easy for any two individuals that want to work together around the world to um, to connect. Culturally, it's really difficult. And I don't, we don't even call it cultural. It's just 
context. The more distant the geography, the harder it is to, the more distant in terms of, you know, physically, um, the harder it is to develop that context in which two people can work effectively together. And so that's, that's the problem we're always, always working to mitigate. Got it. And and do you find, I mean, given when you launched and kind of the, the state of technology at the time, do you find that was, it was good? Like, do you have an advantage because you were early to market there or was it problematic because as the technology shifted, you know, competitors could come in quickly, not have to deal with some of the early stuff you did? I mean, give, give me a sense of how timing played a part or how you kind of view the timing of starting the, the business relative to technology situation. Yeah, no, great question. I think the timing was really good, actually because it allowed us to to learn a lot before people became so accustomed to working remotely as they are today. But even today, well, you know, huge numbers of people are working out of their homes in a way that they weren't back then. And that and the numbers of those people continues to grow. It's still not super intuitive to people that they can just effectively work with somebody far outside of their community. So the market's just expanding. And then as we get better, we can take advantage of that expansion. So that's been really good to us. And how I mean, strategically, how have you kind of positioned or what's been the evolutionary process for figuring out exactly what your kind of service is, what problems you're solving, who you're solving it for? Talk to us about kind of positioning and, and core customer and the niche that, that you've effectively carved out. Yeah. So today we have two very different niches. One is what I built the business on at Bootstrapped, which is kind of your solopreneurs to very small businesses. So people that have often, they've somebody that's left a large professional services firm, maybe t- taken a couple of clients with them, hung out their own shingle, and, they, and they're used to having, at the firm that they've come from, they're used to having the kind of support services that we offer. And, um, and I know that world well, and I enjoy talking with those people and helping to solve their problems, and, um, and we're really good at it. The other half of the business and probably more than half today and growing is um, similar types of people, but who are who are still in those larger professional services environments. So large insurance companies, we've got a couple of NASDAQ listed companies that have a complex enterprise sale and, you know, expensive salespeople that the company doesn't want to have kind of uh, poking data, you know, sticking data into the, they want the visibility, they want the helpfulness of a CRM, but they don't want their executives sitting there, you know, twiddling and figuring out the, you know, kind of turning the knob. So we're good at doing that on their behalf and then everybody's happy. Yeah. Yeah. So you kind of better free them up or take, take away the tasks that are taking up time for them that are kind of low level so they can focus on the higher level, higher level work. Yeah. I mean, that's a, so, you know, anyone in a large firm that's in a business development or sales role, I mean, their real magic is, you know, originating a relationship and managing that relationship through a transaction. It's not kind of being a data entry clerk. And yet there is, you know, there's some important work around that data entry and it needs to be done thoughtfully and, and strategically, but we can do that for them. And, um, and the way a lot of companies try to solve this problem is just, you know, yelling at folks and saying, Hey, get your, get your information in there. And if you, if you don't get it in, you're not going to get your bonus. bonus or something. (laughs) And, and, you know, with us, they're giving them something that's, um, you know, very cost effective and in, and it's, it supports them. It's like, Hey, we're going to give you a support person or Prealto support team. And and that's why everybody's happy. They get the data. Yeah. How, how, I mean, those are, while I can see the service is very, very similar, the, the type of client, the sales process, the value proposition, who you're you're actually selling to seems a little bit different. What do you need to do differently when you're approaching these two different markets? And then how do you kind of, I guess, operationally then how are, is this two different teams? Does the same team service both? How do you, how do you kind of make it work from a market strategy point of view and then an operation point of view? Yeah. So, so, um, so today both niches are, are very important to us. The, those, those smaller businesses are shorter sales cycle. Often, it, you know, somebody comes to us with a lot of pent up demand. And so they're ready to get started right away. But then, you know, the other side of that is their business can change very quickly on them and ebb and flow. And so, you know, we have, we just naturally expect a higher attrition rate. The enterprise sale is, um, you know, where we're doing pilots on, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight executives and then, you know, often supporting 10 to even, you know, 20 executives across a firm. That's a considerably longer sales cycle. It's a, it's a very, well, both sales are very consultative, but that, but when we are working to support a larger enterprise, we're looking at it in the context of, you know, of their entire business. So it's just those, a lot of stakeholders and, 
a lot more conversations. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. And how, um, I guess, operationally, how have you, is this the same team or do you have two distinct teams? Do you have different people that can do either, you know, either niche? Well, it's it's different salespeople, but the service platform is the same. It's just simply that when we're supporting the larger firms, we can just bring, we can apply more resources from the same service platform, but it's it's just that um, the knowledge sharing that happens on the service team is more robust, and so we there's just a lot more we can bring to to the firm that we're supporting. Yeah, it makes sense. And historically, I mean, you you started with the solopreneur or working with the independent consultant kind of solopreneur folk. When did you realize that you could provide this other service? How did that process or strategically? How did you make that decision? How did you start it? What were some of the challenges? Yeah. Well, an enterprise, a larger enterprise sale is, you know, like I said, it's very different than, than selling to an individual decision. You know, you, just the decision when, when there's more than one decision maker, it's just gets more complex. The sale is more complex because the opportunity, you know, we were in the San Francisco Bay area where I started the company. So there's you know, just so many companies you can go and talk to. And so you just, you know, you go, you talk and you listen and you figure out what people need and want and you, you get a sale, you do a case study. So it's, you know, just a lot of um, a lot of grit more than anything else. Yeah, I, I think you know, for the entrepreneurs out there, um, you know, I said those are the two niches today. We did do a very big pivot early on, so that I think it would be good for entrepreneurs to know about. So, so we started the company just before the big financial crisis, and at that time things were really frothy and so we imagined starting a really kind of low price point service to kickstart the business and the thinking was hey you know a few hundred dollars a month if you do you know a couple of neat things for a high velocity executive they're just never going to cancel um when the financial crisis hit and you know what the stock market went you know shrunk by 50 percent or whatever it was um, that sort of mass wealth market grew up just blew up disappeared for for a fair amount of time and so that probably was a blessing in disguise because it forced us to develop the service that we knew we always were going to develop more quickly which was you know really deep a much deeper offering and as we as we deepened the offering and raised the price, attrition went down dramatically. Oh, interesting. So your ability to, to hold on to customers increased as you deeped, as you... As we raised the price. As yeah. you raised the price. Okay. And when you say deepen the service, what were you... I mean, I, I think the price raising helped us, I mean, it helped us qualify out people that didn't need the service, but it also meant that we could support fewer people more carefully. Yeah. Yeah. And, and when you, when you deepen the service, what, what was deepening the service like? I mean, what, what were you providing now or, or at that point that you weren't providing before? Well, we were able to really understand somebody's business and their clients and how they like to be represented and, and really be much more of a strategic partner to, to the professionals that we were supporting. Got it. So they get, you get actually sort of key into their operations and, and speak on their behalf or represent them more more accurately to do, yeah. to do more detail work. Got it. Got it. And where are you finding your talent or what's in, in terms of the service professionals that you're that on your side, where are they located? How's what's that process been like in terms of finding them growing that side of the business? Yeah. So our frontline workers work in our service centers in Manila and Guatemala city. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that's important. Most of the competitors in our space are marketplaces or out of home model. Um, and we are very committed to the concept of professionalizing or reprofessionalizing administrative services and reinventing administrative services for a you know highly technology enabled world. And there's a ton of knowledge sharing that happens in those service centers. You know, physically they look a little bit like a call center, but the behavior is much more like a professional services office. That people are walking around, they're solving problems with each other, they're sharing knowledge, um, all on behalf the companies that we support. So that's our frontline workers and their direct managers. And then onshore in our Portland, Oregon headquarters, we have sales, marketing, but most importantly, our, our engagement managers who are kind of process architects. So they're the ones that are understanding the workflow of our, uh, we call our customers members, um, our members in the, in the accounts that they sit in and helping really do the heavy lifting of creating the context and training the inline support, the um, 
and support person on on those processes. Got it. So, so those those folks can can really sort of sit down with the business and understand exactly how the workflow you know takes place and and what the rules are, what what the needs are, and then they they can kind of map that and then train your administrative staff to actually execute against that. Yeah, with, with the goal of fostering a one-to-one relationship as the service gets up and running, between one-to-one relationship between the the productivity assistant, the PA, the end worker in the, in in our service center, and and the member in North America, the executive. But having that bridge has been there's a, there's a ton of value there. Yeah, I'm sure. What have you noticed in terms of your your best customers? What are they? I guess what are they like, or what are, what are characteristics or qualities that you've you've come to learn around you know your best or your ideal, your core customer? How, how can you how do you identify them? What what makes them different from other customers? Yeah, so the baseline is they need to be what I would call process respectful. Okay. Uh, what I mean by that is you know I'm a little I founded the company to support people like myself, so I'm I'm pretty strategic. I'm running around doing lots of different kinds of things, and I'm not necessarily the most process-oriented person. But I respect process, and so I built a company of really process-oriented people. And so you need to you need to want to be supported by that. Now, I used to think that if somebody was really process-oriented, that they wouldn't get as much value from us. It turns out that those people also get a ton of value, and they they just love what we do because we get how they're organized, and they like the they like that we're taking a process they already have and further optimizing it and continually innovating on it. And um, on the flip side, in terms of your employees, what have you noticed that makes makes a great employee? What have you done in terms of recruiting and interviewing? How do you identify and attract the right talent that's going to be successful in this model? Yeah. Great question. So it's kind of all the cliches. We want somebody that really wants to learn, that has a great attitude, and and we've been burned over and over by somebody that's just great at a few things on day one, but doesn't have a good attitude. So so we definitely manage to our core values, uh, what we call our coils, which is commitment, ownership, integrity, learning, and service, and um, and we're relentless about that. So we 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 um, we're we're uncompromising. So if you know, somebody might come in with great mechanical skills and impress everybody in the beginning, but they are um, they don't have the commitment and have the ownership or the integrity. And, and we definitely will manage those people out really quickly. Uh, on the flip side, we've seen again and again somebody that's, um, you know, got the right humility and wants to learn and, and, and you know, maybe they, they're slower to start, but they um, they get it and they're with us a long time. Yeah. And in terms of training people up, I mean, we you know, we always... You know, we talk about hiring for culture and then training for skills, you know, but training can be difficult or, you know, it's costly. It takes time. It takes money investment. How have you, I guess, what what have you found in terms of what you can train for, what you can't train for? And what's the process like? What have you learned around being able to kind of train people up that, that have the right cultural fit, but don't necessarily have the skills? How do you go about doing that? So we do like we do invest a ton in it but it's it's worth it because because we've got great customers and if if we can train somebody up it can take a while and yet the ROI on that on that training will be really high so a bunch of upfront training and then again because they're in in our centers there is a ton of learning that happens through you know almost through osmosis so it, it's very much a professional services model where they're being kind of mentored by um, by people who have been here you know been with us a long time there are some interesting things I mean we have customers come to us or potential prospects come to us and say you know oh, does the, is the person gonna have an accent and or like yeah they are gonna have an accent just like if if you walk around San Francisco or New York, you you know, you know, half the people you work with have an accent. And but people really when people are asking about an accent, most often they are consciously or unconsciously drawing upon the experience they've had calling a customer support for their, you know, their bank or their computer company and getting a person offshore who doesn't listen to their questions. And it's not the accent that they dislike, it's the poor listening skills. And so it's the, it's when you ask the question and the response is a non sequitur. That's what's painful when you're talking to somebody offshore. And so we actually filter much more for listening skills and again, desire to learn and desire to listen and curiosity 
than we do for accent. And that, that's been important. That's been, we've, we've got people with pretty strong accents that are got a great attention to detail, solve problems and are terrific at support. And we have people maybe because they went to high school here or junior high or something who have perfect American accents, but are dropping balls all the time. Yeah. That's an interesting one. Cause I think it, uh, it happens at so many levels in business is you kind of over optimize or you over select for certain criteria. And in that chew up, you know, time, money, resources, kick out candidates in terms of process, you know, when, when you're, when you really, what you need to do is look at sufficiency, right? Like, I mean, yes, they need to be understandable. It's not that they don't, that they, they need no accent. It's that I just, I need to be able to communicate effectively, you know, up to a point or up to a certain level. And then after that, you know, it, more, more capabilities is not, it's not worth the additional cost and, and, um, you know, complexity in terms of finding folks. And it, then it allows me to find other folks. So you can, you can probably find, you know, talent is probably talent out there that kind of fits this, you know, the sliver of needs that you can leverage, whereas other people are going to be, you know, letting some of those posts go or, or not, not hiring them because of accents when in fact they can actually be really good employees. Yeah, very much. And that's our value in the, in the labor market. So, I mean, you know, we're operating in places where, and it's kind of the other half of our business got two constituencies and they're honestly equal, which is, you know, we've got our customers and we've got, we've got the people that deliver the service and we have to make, uh, and those people really do have to be equal. And so we kind of have a social mission as well. And it's, you know, we go into these markets where a lot of bright young people are answering angry telephone calls all day for their, for a bank or a computer company. And, um, you know, that, that's, uh, every call they pick up is a different person. So it's very transactional and very unforgiving. And it's generally focused on, you know, one or two very specific skills like their like they're not usually problem solving. So it usually is just their voice. Um, and we take people out of those environments and we give them a direct relationship with um, three or four North American executives where they're learning real skills. They're really getting insights into, you know, international business and picking up real skills and, and they're solving problems and they've got a lot of autonomy. That's not for everyone. So there's a lot of self-selecting that happens, but the people who want that environment, they have a great experience and, and, um, and we see people, we see the learning curve. I mean, we see people develop incredibly quickly. Yeah. Well, I think you, you, you point out, you know, a concept or an idea that I think is really important for service-based businesses. And I don't think people think about this enough or think about it this way enough, which is, I mean, every service-based business is really a double-sided market, right? You're trying to find customers and clients, but you're also have to find talent and you know you have to have a strategy right you have to have an offering to the talent side to attract them to retain them just as much as you need you know strategy on the client side i mean tell me more you mentioned this this you know you've got a social mission or you've you know you've you're looking at more than just you know kind of creating a job what do you do or i guess what are some of the things you do when you come into you know a market like this or a community like this to be attractive to be different to be you know compelling proposition for for these folks and you mentioned some of the you know the work that they do is more engaging more you know is is less I guess mundane. Um, what are what are some of the other things that you do to make it attractive for the talent side? Well, I think it's where we spend kind of the, the majority of our gray matter. Um, so we're always in, investing and in thinking about you know what's what's going to be compelling work environment for them. How can we be a great place for them to grow? And so, you know, we're using a lot of the um, kind of happiness at work and positive psychology models that are being applied in North America. So we're big fans of that, you know, kind of the, the Daniel Pink model of, you know, autonomy, mastery and, and, and purpose, but also sensitive to the fact that you know, are coming there in environments that are, you know, this is not kind of Wall Street or Silicon Valley. I mean, and so you can't just kind of uh, retrofit those models onto our work environment without some thoughtfulness. Yeah, yeah. And tell me about, you know, companies that have, you know, are looking for these kind of services of, you know, whether whether it's the solopreneur, independent consultant side, or uh, your organization that can see the ability to kind of leverage their, you know, highly paid experts by surrounding themselves with a, a team like this. What are the, some of the things you need to think about, decision points, things you need to do to before you hire somebody, while you hire them, the things that will make it more successful, more get better results. What are some pieces of advice that you give folks and that are thinking about hiring, you know, a company like yours or, or get services like yours? Yeah. Yeah. Great question. So I think, I think it, it's all the same calculus on whether, you know, you outsource or hire somebody um, when you're, when a professional is working to get leverage, there's kind of, you know, how do I get started? Because my gosh, I'm moving so quickly. I don't even have time to think about what I would delegate. So it's just getting started. It's gosh, 
even if I, you know, took the time to scope out and document what I will delegate, like training the person is going to be so difficult. You know, it's hard enough to manage the person at the desk next to me, let alone out of my office or offshore. And gosh, my gosh, if I do that, you know, I take the time to document so I can get started. I hire and train somebody. And then if they're good, my gosh, they're going to go back to school or, you know, if it's offshore, they're going to go down the street and work for somebody else. And I'm going to be, you know, back to square one. And so, you know, we're set up to, you know, we've been doing this a long time at this point. We have, you know, hundreds of thousands of hours of support experience. And so we can kind of help somebody quickly deduce what they can delegate. We can do a lot of the, um, uh, the training on their behalf. And then we're going to, help uh, maintain continuity. So we don't just train one individual support person. We train a team. We document everything. And so, you know, whether it's us or somebody else, I would be looking for somebody or, or whether it's a firm or an individual who understands all that. So you'll get, especially at kind of the administrative layer that we operate, you'll get a ton of individuals that you can contract with through a marketplace or firms that are just kind of putting a body in a seat will tell you, hey, you know, they'll kind of say they can do anything you ask. So I'd, I'd just be really weary of somebody that says yes to everything and make sure they're asking good questions and that they're being honest about what is easier and harder to delegate and how long things take to get started and, and what's going to be required of you as a customer to be successful. Yeah, no, it makes sense. This has been great. Uh, Eric, if people want to find out more about you, about the work that you do, about the services that you offer, what's the best place to get that information? Yeah, so our website is full of information, Prialto, P-R-I-L-E. A L T O dot com, Prialto dot com. Our blog, we take it really seriously. We're not, uh, it's not just clickbait. We, we live and breathe this stuff, and it's a great resource. I think whether you are going to, you know, hire us or, or anyone else. Great. I'll make sure that the link is in the show notes so people can get click through and, and get that information. Thanks for taking the time today. I think this is a really, it's a it's an interesting topic. I think it's, you know, obviously, you know, huge in terms of business these days of how to kind of find leverage, use resources like this. I like the approach you're taking and really kind of looking at it as a professional services model. So, you know, this is good. I'm really helpful for the audience. I appreciate you taking the time today. Yeah. Well, thanks for the questions. It's been fun. You've been listening to Scaling Up Services with business coach Bruce Eckfeldt. To find a full list of podcast episodes, download the tools and worksheets, and access other great content, visit the website at scalingupservices.com. And don't forget to sign up for the free newsletter at scalingupservices.com slash newsletter.